on WNIN Lawmakers this week. Our guests are Indiana State Senator Mark Mesmer and Indiana State Representative Wendy McNamara. We'll be talking about what's been happening during the Indiana General Assembly session so far this year. That's coming up next on WNIN Lawmakers. I'm John Gibson, Morning Edition host for WNIN-FM. Today our guests are Indiana State Senator Mark Mesmer and Indiana State Representative Wendy McNamara. Before we speak with them, let's get a quick update from Indianapolis. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Brandon Smith reports on the week at the State House. The House GOP's proposed state budget includes a smaller increase for traditional public K-12 schools than Governor Eric Holcomb's budget. Instead, House Republicans prioritize a significant expansion of vouchers for private schools. They also want to spend budget reserve dollars differently than the governor. Rather than hundreds of millions to pay down state debt, the House GOP plan creates programs to help children with learning loss from the pandemic, help small businesses recover, and improve facilities at the state's law enforcement academy. A House committee debated a bill to eliminate the state's license requirement to carry a handgun in public. Some law enforcement groups, the state police, the chiefs of police, and the Fraternal Order of Police oppose that, arguing it will have dangerous consequences. But others, including the Sheriff's Association, say the measure will boost individual freedom. And legislation headed to the House would allow businesses to appeal fines and shutdowns by local health officers to their city council or county commissioners. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Brandon Smith at the State House. All right, Senator Mesmer, uh, glad you could join us. There are some efforts uh, this uh, legislative session to limit the governor's ability to make emergency declarations, or at least uh, the length of them, uh, by requiring legislative approval for long-term emergencies, such as the one we're in, the COVID pandemic. Uh, how do you feel about calling uh, an emergency session if the governor declares an emergency? Well, uh, it would not have to, in any of the bills that are filed, it would not require that the governor call us into session when he issues the, the emergency order. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for current energy crisis energy orders, for the governor to extend the energy order, he has to get approval from the General Assembly. Uh, that was a legislation passed in the 70s, uh, anticipating long-term uh, energy crisis issues, the, uh, the general duty ti uh, Title 10 emergency orders, uh, say that after 30 days, the General Assembly can terminate an, an emergency order at any time, but it doesn't allow for any uh, any process when we're out of session. There's no mechanism in place for the General Assembly to call themselves back into session. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor could call us back into session, but I, I doubt that he would call us into session just to terminate uh, his order. So uh, this is really uh, unintended uh, long-term use of an emergency order that wasn't an anticipated when those statutes were written. And we're just trying to clarify that moving forward, um, that at, and then what the, I think the House bill has a slightly different uh, angle than, than what our Senate bill will have. Right. Uh, is, is, uh, the House bill would have, I think, after 30 days, legislative council to be involved with uh, uh, deciding whether to call us into session. And then uh, the Senate bill that we're going to be working on, Senate Bill 407, will say that after 30 days, you know, for the for the governor to continue emergency, an emergency order, uh, he'd he'd have to get uh, affirmative action from the General Assembly. Why Why uh, do you think it's important for the General Assembly to uh, to weigh in at that point? Uh, uh, why Why should the governor, you know, essentially not have that power beyond 30 days? Uh, be, well, because he's not the eyes, ears, and and feet on the ground uh, in in all 92 counties in the state. He he he's very comfortable and and very familiar with what's happening uh, in the Indianapolis metro area, but but is doubtful that he's you know hearing uh, comments, seeing uh, wanting you know uh, taking feedback from very many people outside his sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a balance of power in in the uh, in the state house that's supposed to be equal between the general assembly and the governor, not you know not a uh, not an authoritarian uh, you know dictatorship and and. Uh, he did collaborate with us somewhat. Uh, he, you know, he he would tell us, you know, what he was doing after it was announced. Uh, we did at, we did offer quite a bit of feedback to him in in April, May, and June, uh, up till the first week in June, 
but then he quit asking for our input after that. So um, the process should be uh, collaborative. If there's if if there were things in the in the early emergency orders that were, uh, you know, truly beyond what we thought was was reasonable, there's no reason why the General Assembly and 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 folks in the General Assembly shouldn't have some say in in uh, in, in offering a voice mm -hmm. to the people that we represent. Can you, uh, w would you say uh, during the pandemic, uh, was there a time that you thought the, uh, the governor was uh, perhaps becoming unreasonable? Did you think some of the restrictions uh, went too far? I, out of the gate, I thought they were, uh, for him to have uh, basically religious services shut down uh, at the beginning of the pandemic or limited to 10 people, when you could go into any, any large box store, you could go to Costco, Sam's, Walmart, anywhere else and have 500 people. In, in a in a retail establishment, but to, to but to limit uh, religious institutions from having only ten, uh, that that was that was uh, overboard uh, for him shutting down elective procedures at hospitals at the front end of the pandemic when there was no uh, there was no imminent threat of them running out of bed space. Uh, you know, we asked him in, in middle of, in the middle of April to uh, you know unplug that restriction. He did a couple weeks later. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, he did. You know, uh, in a in a delayed time after you know, I mean, into in his second extension of his of his emergency order, uh, which was uh, well on its way to to bankrupting most of our uh, medical institutions that with with no elective procedures and no tidal wave of COVID patients at the front end of the pandemic. Um, you know, I mean, that was that was unreasonable, yeah. and and yeah. even just declaring some businesses non essential. And shutting down family businesses across the state, I could go into any large any large mega retailer and buy clothes, but I couldn't go, go into my local clothing store owned by you know by a small family business and and buy the same items, uh, you know, in, in that scenario. So there was just uh, we felt uh, you know illogical decisions on uh, deeming you know certain businesses as not essential, and and felt that you know some of those were. Uh, out of order. Now, in time, yeah. they all opened up after you know thousands of them you know went out of business. Well, let's uh, speaking of uh, businesses and the COVID pandemic, uh, Senate Bill One has uh, passed the House now. It provides a civil immunity in reference to a COVID. Uh, you were, as I understand it, an author of of this bill. Why do you think uh, that's important? Uh, yeah, I was the author of the bill, and and uh, and whether you're a business a, a Community group, a religious organization, a K through 12 ed uh, institution, a higher ed institution, uh, offering civil per civil immunity protection for claiming someone got uh, COVID-19, you know, from you, and and was going to take you to to court for you know for civil damages, uh, in, in a uh, for the economy, for the uh, the society as a whole, to ever get back to normal, that cloud of uncertainty uh, needed to be uh, lifted, and 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 folks offered protection. If you're doing uh, your your best you can do to offer protection for your customers, for your employees, uh, for the members of your organization, you shouldn't have to you know fear a looming threat of a lawsuit uh, for you know from COVID-19. Uh, you know and and felt that was imperative you know as a Senate leadership priority to get that that uh, civil protection in place for all the citizens of Indiana. All right, and you mentioned priorities. Of course, this is a budget, budget session of the Indiana General Assembly. Uh, what are your priorities in the, in the new budget? Uh, well, obviously, you know, from the Senate side, we are we are second uh, bite at that apple uh, on the budget. But uh, clearly, as always, we want to have a, a, a fiscally sound, balanced budget. Uh, the, the the key priorities for that are going to be, you know, funding K through 12 education. Uh, that's that's the majority of the budget in, in every budget year mm -hmm. and continuing to look for ways to increase spending uh, for, you know, for K to 12 education or in in, uh, in our state. And then there's just a myriad of other, you know, other items that will fall, you know, you know, uh, in, in place after that. But uh, K through 12 education, I mean, Medicaid's a huge chunk of our budget as well. So, um, you know, right. they, but just n normal budget priorities. We'll look we'll look for ways to help support, uh, in, you know, Indiana businesses that have have uh, been hit pretty hard, you know, through the pandemic as well. I think it's part of the uh, part of one of the House bills that, that I'll be the sponsor on in the Senate. All righty. And uh, 
Speaking of, uh, of bills and uh, bills that, that you have, in fact, authored, uh, Senate Bill 389 repeals some uh, state regulations on wetlands. It's passed the Senate, uh, not overwhelmingly. Uh, I know it, it's been controversial among a few folks. Uh, could you explain what's in that wetlands bill and, uh, and why you thought it was necessary? Well, sure. Uh, Senate Bill 389 deals with isolated wetlands, and, and you would look out and you'd see this nice duck pond or this swamp and think, you know, oh, the, 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 the General Assembly's out to destroy, you know, what, what, what is a traditional regulated wetland by the EPA. And there's a, a clear delineation between what a isolated wetland is, uh, a, a low spot in a field uh, would be considered an isolated wetland. Um, you know, the places that that uh, you or I would look around our communities and, and never think, uh, you know, that these little the, the little uh, patch of trees or a low, a low spot in a, in a uh, commercial development uh, would be considered I isolated wetlands. But that's the types of wetlands that the state regulates. And the problem is not so much in 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 what the regulation set up, but more so how IDEM has been applying the standards. Uh, agriculture is supposed to be exempt. It's, it is exempt in the law, but as IDEM has carried out that that uh, that law over the last 15 or so years, they've determined if a farmer has a, a place in his fields where the tiles get get blocked up and he can't farm it for a year that it's no longer agricultural. And so for him to, to get use of his, his own land back, uh, he's got to remediate at a two to one, four to one uh, ratio to get to get his acreage back into production or pay a fee in lieu of, uh, you know, a fine, you know, to the, to the IDEM to let somebody else uh, restore some, some acreage in another place. And clearly that, that was never the legislative intent, uh, intent from, from the isolated wetland statutes uh, you've got commercial developers, uh, you know, within uh, within areas that, that butt up to city limits where they buy some agricultural property, and and all of a sudden that agricultural property, uh, you know, becomes uh, tagged as an isolated wetland and 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 cost uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to try to remediate and impacts the ability for you know for uh, routine development. Right. So it's not so much it's not so much the law; it's it's the then the implementation of the law. And our goal at the end of the day was never to to completely wipe out uh, the isolated wetland statutes. It's to and, and I have, as well as many other legislators, been ter concerned with talking to IDEM for years about their implementation of their isolated wetlands program to no avail. And so, uh, striking the wetland statute uh, in the first half of session was is is primarily designed to get them to work with us to come up with. Uh, reasonable adjustments to their statutes that that uh, they agree need to be done. They they agree the remediation ratios are out of line, and they agree agricultural property should have never been handled the way it's being handled today. And mm -hmm. and uh, the the end goal is to fix the problem, uh, not necessarily eliminate the statute. But if they won't uh, carry on reasonable uh, discussions on how to how, on how to adjust and implement their statutes, then then you know, the bill could potentially move forward as it is. We have just uh, a minute left. Any uh, quick uh, initiatives that you're looking forward to promoting once we hopefully emerge uh, from the pandemic? Uh, we just a um, minute left. Oh, sure. Well, I just always look for ways to help improve our, our uh, Indiana economy to make, in, uh, you know, our schools the best place to, to go to school, our businesses the best place to uh, run, grow, and own a business. Uh, you know, just look looking through our Senate priorities from the bills that I'm working on. It's always looking out for the best interest of the people of Indiana. All right, Senator Mark Mesmer join, joining us uh, through Skype. We certainly appreciate you uh, taking part in the uh, technology here and joining us today. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. Welcome to Representative McNamara, who serves Posey County and a part of Vandenberg County as well. Good to have you with us once again. Thank you very much. All right, well, Representative McNamara, uh, let's start with uh, the same question we, we uh, spoke to uh, Senator Mesmer about. Uh, there are some efforts in the legislature uh, this session to limit the governor's ability to make emergency declarations, or at least uh, link, you know, the length of them, uh, by requiring legislative approval for long-term emergencies, such as the COVID pandemic that we're in. Uh, how do you feel about that idea, about uh, calling an emergency session if the governor declares an emergency? Well, no one could have ever predicted that we'd be 10 months into a pandemic and continuation after continuation of executive order mm -hmm. uh, without really any input from the legislature. Uh, 
House Bill 1123 uh, passed this week out of the House uh, containing those emergency order um, reviews. Mm -hmm. It gives us the opportunity to call ourselves uh, in a way back into the legislature. Uh, we have what's called a legislative council mm -hmm. and it would meet and give us specific reasons to come back. We can't just call a meeting for ourselves to come back uh, just for the mere fact of doing so. Right, right. Um, whatever would be laid out in that specific uh, decision from the Legislative Council, that would be the only thing we would be allowed to discuss. So a lot of the same comments that uh, Senator Messmer had or things that I encountered over the last uh, you know, 10 mm -hmm. months from mm -hmm. my constituency as well. I thought he was very thorough. Uh, we do have in that legislation some triggers to make sure that we're not just jumping the gun and, and saying that we're going to call ourselves into session at, at right. every single uh, event. Uh, so uh, I think it's well thought out. I think it does not uh, usurp or go beyond uh, what would be expected of us mm -hmm. uh, to be able to really represent our, our constituencies across the state of Indiana. With the House bill... Uh have essentially that 30-day period there where, say, the governor declares an emergency, then 30 days later you folks can get together and, and, uh, and, and, and essentially vote on it? It does, and in addition, we can't go beyond, I think it's 40 days okay. after that, so we can't stay in session in perpetuity. We have a limit mm -hmm. on the amount of time that we can be there as well. All right. Well, as we were speaking to uh, the senator earlier, and you know it as well as uh, all of us, that this is a budget session mm -hmm. of the Indiana General Assembly. Uh, could you tell us some of your priorities in the, in the new budget? I'm carrying a House agenda bill, House Bill 1008, which is a summer, a summer remediation uh, program. And it doesn't have to just be used during the summer, but it provides $150 million uh, for students who might have suffered learning loss due to COVID. Mm -hmm. It will allow uh, school corporations, uh, clubs, other types of entities to apply for a grant from the Department of Education to receive dollars so that they can help these kids catch up. Um, mm -hmm. There's a Stanford study that our students have already lost eight to nine months of education. And if you already had a student that is at risk, that could potentially put that student back two years especially if they're in a school corporation that might have been doing all virtual learning uh, this year. So it's my hope. Uh, House Bill 1008 is in the Senate, right. and uh, those dollars uh, hopefully will help our kids catch up um, or at least close some of the gap that's occurred due to COVID. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little more about school funding. Uh, bills have passed uh, both the uh, Indiana House and Senate to address the virtual versus in-person aspects of school mm -hmm. funding. Uh, how is it, or how important is it, as you see it, uh, for, for the schools to get this uh, legislation passed? So House Bill 1003, I believe it is, uh, provides for 100% of funding to schools for virtual learning. We had to do that basically because the way we had written it in statute prior is not to fully fund virtual learning. Mm -hmm. We didn't, again, have this idea in mind as a pandemic came across. So we wanted to make sure uh, our school corporations were fully funded. I look at my school, um, my students have gone, had to uh, do virtual learning from March until uh, the end of school, and mm -hmm. then a few days here and there throughout uh, the school year. Mm -hmm. uh, to say it hasn't been a challenging school year for teachers uh, would be an understatement. Trying to, at any point in time, do four different methods of teaching uh, in, in a particular classroom where you might have a student on um, Zoom and right. kids in the classroom and a student might be pulled out due to quarantine. So uh, hats off to our teachers who have responded with uh, utmost professionalism and um, yeah. anything we can do to help them continue to help the classrooms is, yeah. is a good move forward. Now overall school funding, as I understand it, uh, House Bill uh, is actually seeking a, a little less than the governor was seeking, uh, I think about 65 million. Uh, can you tell us what, why, why is that? What, what was it in the governor's uh, uh, proposal that uh, perhaps, perhaps you or others uh, didn't, didn't care for so much? Well, the budget hasn't come down yet specifically, so I'm mm -hmm. not uh, in a lot of conversations in regards to that, but it should be noted that um, there are 
an additional $400 million or $425 million for education uh, at and above what we've spent in the past. I was looking at uh, just the sheer numbers, 61% of the state budget, which is $36 billion, goes mm -hmm. to K to college education. So we are already taking up a large chunk of the education budget, and you'll see an increase already there. Uh, part of it is coming to my $150 million for the remediation, so mm -hmm. that might be why you'll see the difference in the budget there. Uh, you're going to have some of those monies being diverted so that we can work on that learning loss I talked about. Yeah, uh, you mentioned teachers and it's been a very challenging time for teachers of course. Question always comes up, but what about teacher pay? Uh, are we seeing a, a, a pay increase for teachers across Indiana? I do know that in the budget they have the teacher uh, reward program again. Uh, I don't again know the nuances at this time of, of what's been discussed as far as teacher pay in the budget. Uh, you will see our budget reflecting local control mm -hmm. in a lot of ways and wanting our, our local communities to be able to offer the best to their teachers that they can. All right, well, let's move on to uh, House Bill 1201. Uh, it's a bill that uh, you wrote, as I understand it, which would allow the transport of injured operational mm -hmm. canines by ambulance if one is available. Uh, what were your reasons for writing that bill? Uh, I understand it has passed the House and is headed to the Indiana Senate. It's a little unusual, I would think. <laughs> why, why, why that measure? A lot of times bills come to us directly from our constituents and in this case a local EPD officer uh, found me and contacted me and asked me if I would uh, sponsor this piece of legislation and uh, since then I've been contacted by law enforcement officers across the state of Indiana and even outside of Indiana. Mm -hmm. You would think that they in, in most cases would just uh, put the police dog in the back of the vehicle and take them to the closest vet, right. but that isn't always going to be able to, to take place. Um, there was a police canine that was killed in the line of duty up in Fishers, Indiana, and had this been available to that particular dog in that particular instance, they might have been able to save him. Uh, it, you have to create a, a partnership with the ambulance service prior to any transportation, just so mm -hmm. you know what's going to be covered and what won't. Right. But uh, that came to me directly from, from an EPD officer. I see. All right, well, let's move on to some other uh, issues that have been getting a lot of attention. Uh, one is a measure, or maybe measures, uh, to uh, essentially do away with uh, gun permits and, and the revenue that that uh, uh, generates is uh, pretty significant, as I understand it. Uh, can you tell us your, your thoughts on that? Uh, do you think uh, gun licenses uh, essentially should be done away with? There's a significant financial incurrence, like you said, uh, do, doing away with, with the gun permits. Um, again, that's another bill that I'm not sure of the nuances of it. It just came out of committee yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't had the time to review specifically what it says or what it does. I do know um, most of your law enforcement organizations are opposed to it, uh, some of it for financial reasons and others just for safety sake. Mm -hmm. um, what I do know is it, will continue to protect those people that lawfully carry their guns and those that choose not to, it will continue to uh, be able to be enforced. So um, it's, a, it's a complicated matter, I think, in some cases, because you have reciprocal licenses in other states, so you need to make sure that if another state requires a, a permit that we don't, how's mm -hmm. that person going to be able to go to that state and carry? So uh, this, will be on second reading, I believe, on Monday, and uh, I'll learn more about it then when we have those conversations. Yes, I, I, assume, I assume we all will. Um, one other uh, issue that's been uh, talked about quite a bit, uh, uh, some legislation about uh, anti-rioting legislation, mm -hmm. I guess you would call it, to strengthen some of those, uh, uh, those penalties. Uh, are, are you in favor of that? I, I authored a bill on uh, anti-rioting, and primarily because I uh, went up to Indianapolis in July for an event mm -hmm. and to see our capital city destroyed really struck me in a way that uh, I found very difficult to not... Now, no, no, to be clear, the capital city was not destroyed, right? The, the buildings, the offices, when, when you go there, you, you can still see today that there are businesses that are boarded up. 
Uh, the city, no, it was not destroyed, but all the businesses around the circle had all the windows broken in. Um, they had spray paint all over everything. Mm -hmm. um, I witnessed in October an individual walking down the street with a crowbar at, uh, preparing for another potential protest. Um, I don't care what you're protesting. I want Indiana to be the most welcoming place for those who want to peacefully protest, but I also want Indiana to be the toughest place to ever uh, consider doing a, a violent protest of any kind. I want uh, people to pay reparations to business owners for uh, the looting that took place, mm -hmm. the damage to their business, and if a person gets injured defending their own business, I want them to be able to have their medical costs covered. Uh, I think responsibility and ultimate responsibility um, is number one, if you're going to uh, want to peacefully assemble, you want to make sure that those people around you will do so as well. Mm -hmm. And to this day, there are still buildings boarded up in Indianapolis that have not opened yet. There are businesses that, um, who knows if they will ever open up right. again. So yes, I, I am very much in favor of harsher punishments for people who uh, riot and, and do so um, with the intent to do damage. We have just a minute or so left. Um, what are some of the initiatives you're looking forward to, and maybe just uh, one at, the, at this point since our time is short, uh, that you look forward to uh, as we hopefully emerge from this uh, COVID crisis? Sure. I, I'm carrying several pieces of legislation. One's for the governor. It's on um, driver's license suspensions. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks get their license suspended because they can't pay the fee uh, and it becomes a circular process. They drive with a suspended license, they get pulled over, then they continue just the whole process. Mm -hmm. Hopefully uh, this bill is going to be on second reading on Monday. It will allow if an individual can show proof of financial responsibility within 100 days, they'll have a stay of that suspension. Um, also in there is their workforce training. If you go into workforce training, uh, you can have the fee suspended as well. So uh, opportunities exist there. I've always men already mentioned House Bill 1008, the $150 million oh, dollars right. for school. So uh, a lot of good priorities uh, still yet to come. All right. State Representative Wendy McNamara, thank you so much for joining us. No problem. We thank you. We certainly appreciate it. And, uh, we also want to thank Senator Messmer, who we spoke to earlier. Uh, next week, our scheduled guest is U.S. Senator Todd Young. I'm John Gibson with WNIN-FM. Thanks for joining us for WNIN Lawmakers.